the Lord this morning? I'm feeling it. Here we go. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Hey, oh, going to shout out your praise. Put your hands together. Oh, we worship you this morning. Thank you for what you've done. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore would be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds me There's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, he holds the soul away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, 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 oh. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, sing it out. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy. time we were we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace and let the house of the lord sing praise do you believe it we were the beggars yeah now we're royalty we were the prisoners Forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Hey, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. 
them some praise this morning. Hey. I'm so grateful. God, we just say thank you so much for all that you've done for us. God, I ask for a supernatural joy of the Lord to pour in this place in the name of Jesus. You know, on Easter Sunday, you get a lot of new people, and actually, I see a lot of new faces. And by the way, on the outside, I can see you. Just give me a little wave, because I can actually see you on the outside there. I see a lot of new faces, and here at Living Stones Church, we love the joy of the Lord. So it's okay to dance, it's okay to clap, it's okay to shout. And if we're ever going to do those things, Easter Sunday is the morning that we do those things. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Wanting a place to hide this weak soul This bad bones I try with all my might But I just can't win this fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond But then And just when I ran out the road I met a man I didn't know He told me that I was not alone Cause he picked me up He turned me around He set my feet on solid ground I thank the Master I thank the Savior Cause he healed my heart Changed my name Forever free I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God, yeah! I cannot deny what I've seen, got no choice but to believe, my doubts are burning, yeah! Like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friend. That burden and bitterness You can just keep them moving You ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you saved my soul This wayward son has found his way back Cause he picked me up He turned me around he set my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Cause He healed my heart, He changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God, hey! Come on, sing this out He lost another one Lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. One more time. Hey, lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hey, lost another one. I am free. I. Come on, shout it out. Hey, hey, lost another one. I am free. Yeah.
Come on, turn to your neighbor, say, Hell lost another one, but I am free. I am free. Come on, look around. Hell lost another one, but I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I look around you. We're all free this morning. Hell lost another one. Another one, I am free. I am free. I am free. He'll last another one. I am free. I am free. Hey, cause he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. And I thank the master, I thank the savior. To heal my heart, and he changed my name. Forever free, I'm not a saint. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Hey, I thank God. Come on, church, shout it out. I thank God. One last time. I thank God. Jesus, we just say thank you, thank you for what you've done for us, God. Our hearts are filled with gratitude this morning, God. Our hearts are filled with joy, God. We're so grateful for what you've done for us, God.
rising sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus. shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my case transfixed on Jesus sacrifice God amen amen turn to your neighbor say he is risen you guys can have a seat amen um well good morning happy resurrection Sunday <clears throat> excuse me uh, kids can head out for children's ministry now that's for kids up to the fifth grade under the tent and uh two years old and under may go in that building out to the north here have just a couple of quick announcements uh, for everybody. Number one, first of all, we have water baptisms coming up next Sunday. Water baptism is for you if you've placed your faith, trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation. If you've never been water baptized before, next Sunday is the time to do it. If you've got questions about what's involved in that, talk to somebody in the prayer ministry team after the service here. Uh, if you are going to get baptized, the only thing you need to do is show up ready to make that profession of faith and wear something you don't mind getting wet. What we do is we do the baptisms right outside here uh, in the ocean, but not in the ocean. That is, we put a tub right at the edge of the ocean, and we do that because we used to do them in the ocean, and too many people got bloodied in the process of it. So it's in the tub now, but it is right there at the ocean. If you are not getting baptized, we invite you to stay around and celebrate with us as witnesses of the testimony of faith these people who are getting baptized are making. Um, it'll be right after the third service next week. That means right about 11.45, 12 o'clock. Second uh, announcement is we have a missions trip to Mexico in June. 
and we're doing a Taco Throwdown fundraiser for that this Friday right here at 6 o'clock. Now, Taco Throwdown, there's been some misconceptions on what that's all about. That doesn't mean we throw tacos down. If you saw the video a couple of weeks ago, you might have gone away thinking that. It's the idea, it's a contest to see who makes the best taco. So if you want to enter a taco, talk to Jody out at the connection table and we'll get you signed up for that. But everybody's welcome to come on out and enjoy the, uh, the fellowship and, and the fun uh, for that. For that. Uh, last announcement, we've got free Bibles. Every week we have free Bibles. If you're here and you don't have a Bible, we've got them outside. Take one, um, just take one, and we'd love to be able to help you in the process of understanding what that's all about. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you today. Thank you for your amazing goodness and love. Thank you for the gift of your son on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience in going to the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing resurrection life for Jesus to walk out of that tomb for us in the future to be able also to rise from the dead. We ask you today, Holy Spirit, to move on hearts and minds, to move in a real way, to bring that experience of you, Lord Jesus, into play. I ask that you'd you'd deal personally, work personally with individual lives, online, outside, inside, all of it. We ask in the power of Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have some pieces of paper here that in... Most instances are my notes. They are not today. Um, What happened this morning, I got up. I had two or three different directions to go in. I'm thinking Easter. It's got to be a good Sunday. It's got to be a package deal. It's got to be tight and sharp. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, no, this Sunday is for some particular people who are coming in. This is not for the amen corner. This is for those that are, are, are looking at some questions that they've been looking at for a while, perhaps. So let me preface what we're about to do with two questions. Number one, first of all, and let me say, before I ask the question, if you answer this question by raising your hand, there will be no follow-up. In other words, nobody's going to ask you to fill out a card. Nobody's going to give you a phone call. The question is this. Number one, who is here for the first time on a Sunday morning? First time you've been here on a Sunday morning. Again, no follow-up. Nobody's going to do anything. Just curious. Curious. In this church on Sunday morning. Yeah, okay, good. That's nice. Now, second question. This is going to make some people nervous. Who is here for the first time since Christmas Eve? Okay. Good. That's okay. That's good. That's good. I know you're going somewhere else in the meantime. The idea, the idea with this is, you know, I'd like to have a feel for who's, who's here. What we're all about is Jesus. We're all about Jesus. Jesus Christ is who we want to present to every person. And what we believe is that most of the time, the journey to know Jesus is a process. That yes, it many times looks like it's a once and done instantaneous, I get it, I woke up from the dead. That's what we see when we go to Billy Graham crusades. I I used to, I've worked as a counselor in a Billy Graham crusade before. It's wonderful as you see hundreds and thousands of people coming out of the stands to make that, that profession of faith in Jesus and you go, wow, they got it tonight. And they did. But most often, almost all the time, the the moment of coming into contact of recognition and faith that Jesus, who he said he was, is a process. There's a stirring that happened beforehand, a stirring that happened that caused you to have some questions, a stirring that happened that caused you to think about things eternal, to think about God. And then that culminates in the moment. So what we're about around here is the process of helping you through the process. We feel like we've got a commission from God to help you along the journey that he has you on. He's got all of us on a journey. The journey is one that we we describe as a growth track, four parts. Number one, to know God. That's the first thing we want to do, help people know God, who he is, and that happens through Jesus Christ. We have twice a year what we call an alpha course, six-week process of learning about Jesus and how to move into relationship with him. Next one will be in September. If you're around, we, we hope you can come to that. We also have other methods by which that happens, Sunday morning, small groups, one-on-one opportunities to have discussion. But Number one, first and foremost, to know God. Second part of the process is to find freedom. To find freedom. People are here today in bondage. In bondage from sin that you can't get out of. In bondage from religion that makes you feel like you're caught in a trap. In bondage from spirituality, a false spirituality that looks to everything else but Jesus to find the way to make that connection with God. We want to help you find freedom from those things and freedom from any other bondage that's in your life because Jesus said, one of the things he said, 
that his purpose in coming was to set us free. I mean, what's the goal of Christianity? The goal, in a nutshell, to be free. Number three, third part of that growth track is to discover your purpose. Know God, find freedom, and then discover why you're here. Discover the purpose God has for you. He created you with a purpose. He created you to fulfill a purpose. And the only way you ever find out what your purpose really is is when you're around other people who are also intent on finding their purposes and helping you to find yours. And we want to do that. And then finally, making a difference. We know God, we find freedom, we discover our purpose, and then we step in to make a difference with the lives that God has given us. All of us have that sense. Down deep, some of it's hidden by junk that's piled up in your life, but down deep, you want to make a difference with your life. And again, we want to be a part of of seeing that happen. So, what's today all about? Today is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the most amazing event in history. It divides history. History before Jesus Christ looked forward to him. History after Jesus Christ looked back upon him. And it's centered on this supernatural event of his resurrection, his rising from the dead. Now, before we jump into that, I think it's important for us to know the story. The big picture story. So many times, like if you've come to... to this service on Easter Sunday, and the last time you came was the last Easter Sunday, and the next time you're going to come is the next Easter Sunday, you you have this idea that it's all about the resurrection. And in a sense, it is. But the resurrection has to be understood in the context. What's the storyline? What's the big picture? The big picture is this. Jesus Christ entered history, came to earth a little over 2,000 years ago. He was born in a, a nowhere village to a teenage mother who was unwed, and who was a virgin. He then spent the first 30 years of his life in obscurity as a carpenter. And then he moved into public ministry for three years, where he came into it with a bang, raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, and proclaiming the good news of a kingdom that God had brought, a kingdom that God was still in the process of bringing. And then, at the end of that earthly ministry, He died, but the death wasn't final. He rose again, ascended to heaven with the promise that he's coming again. What we're in right now is the conclusion of what's called Holy Week. It's the last week of Jesus' life, and it is the most important week in the life of the most important man who ever lived, and it's a week that started last Sunday with what's called Palm Sunday. Jesus was in this little town called Bethany, a couple miles outside of Jerusalem, and he decides to enter into Jerusalem. He knows this is God's plan for him, so he enters in, and what happens? Palm Sunday. People are lying in the streets going, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're praising him. They're proclaiming him as the Messiah sent from God, the king of Israel. They're they're excited. They're all for Jesus at that point. Week progresses on, you hit Thursday, called Monday Thursday. And this is where Jesus and the disciples celebrate the Passover together. And Jesus introduces a transition in the Passover from the Old Testament version, which happened in Egypt with Israel, to what it was actually pointing towards. Even back then in Egypt, the Passover was pointing towards Jesus coming again, and Jesus was in that last supper with his disciples, participating in Passover, but explaining to them what it meant. What it meant in terms of the wine and the bread that he shared with them that it represented a new covenant that God was establishing in his blood. Now, what happens then? What happens then? The disciples, they don't have a clue what all that means. I mean, they're listening to him, doing like we would do, nodding our heads like we understand the profound statements that he's making. And then he gets through with the, um, the, the, the supper, and he starts washing their feet. And he says, a new command I give to you, that you love one another. That's why it's called Monday Thursday, because Monday means command, and the command is to love. To love, not where you've got to wash people's feet necessarily, but to love in a manner that is humble, to love in a manner that serves the needs of the people around us. He does that, and then he says, okay, let's go. The disciples have no clue where they're going. They just get up, it's nighttime, and they follow him. And he goes out to this dark garden, it's called Gethsemane. The disciples follow him there, they're tired, it's been a rough week, and all of them fall asleep. All of them fall asleep while he's praying. And then they wake up because they hear a familiar jangling, the jangling of Roman swords. Now, they've been in Jerusalem before. They've heard this before because the Roman soldiers are all over the place. They hear the jangling of the swords, and that wakes them up. And when they wake up, they see Judas, Judas, one of the 12 disciples. Judas comes up and kisses Jesus on the cheek. 
And that's the identification that he was going to provide to the, the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers on who to get. And so they got him. They arrested Jesus. All the disciples take off running. They flee. They flee. Jesus comes in, and that night he's tried. It was a long night for Jesus. He's tried, and he's convicted. He's finally, after going through a series of, of trials, really, he ends up for a second time in front of Pilate. And this is Friday morning by this time. And Pilate brings him out in front of the people. Now, Pilate at this point doesn't think Jesus has done anything worthy of death. death. The disciples at this point have kind of come back in and they're, they're watching the process most likely. He doesn't address this directly in scripture, but you can assume from the context and all that you see afterwards that the disciples are there watching the process. And what happens? Pilate says, nothing wrong with this guy. I'm going to let him go. Now, the disciples are looking and what do they see? They see somebody they don't even recognize because he has been beaten to a pulp. His face is all cut up and puffy. He's got this weird crown, this circle of thorns on his head. He's got a purple shawl about him, and he looks horrible. Pilate says, I'm going to let him go. The people, the mass of people who just a few days before had been saying, Hosanna, the Messiah, our King, what are they saying now? They're going, crucify him, crucify him. I mean, that's how fickle we are. That's how fickle people are. As the, the, the course of noise starts, if you're caught up in a crowd, you'll say Hosanna. Or if you're caught up in another crowd, you'll say crucify him. And that's what they did. They cried it out, and Pilate said, so be it. He sent him to be crucified. He sent him to the cross. Jesus carried his cross part of the way. They got another guy to help him part of the way. And then they nailed Jesus to the cross, and they stick it in the ground with crosses on either side of him. And then he's hanging there on that cross. And what happens is, is weird and profound because an earthquake comes and the sky turns like night and for several hours it's dark and then finally Jesus dies. The disciples, they're still quiet. They're not claiming to know anything about this guy. After he dies, not one of the 12, not one of the 11 that are left try to get the body, but this guy, rich Jewish guy named Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus, go to Pilate and ask for the body. And they take the body down off the cross, reverently, and they wrap it in a burial shawl. And Joseph takes it to his tomb, probably in a garden in his own yard, and put the body in the tomb. And it's then, then, then sealed with a heavy stone. So Friday closes. Disciples... I mean, they're thinking, wow, this has been three wasted years of our life. This guy who said he was the Messiah obviously isn't because you can't kill the Messiah. And then they spend a Saturday. A Saturday discouraged, a Saturday disappointed, a Saturday who knows what all was going through their minds. And then Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, they take some spices, burial spices, and they go to the tomb. And... They get there, and the stone has been rolled away. And as, as we read the account in several of the Gospels, the same account is put in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with different details in each one. We're told in, in Luke's account, Luke 24, that she goes running back, goes running back to the disciples, or as many as were gathered at the time, and she has a run-in with Peter and John. And as soon as she says, the the tomb's empty, they've taken him, and we don't know where they've taken him. Peter is out the door running. John takes a few minutes longer, it looks like, and then he takes off running. And then John makes the point of saying, and I ran faster than Peter, and I got to the tomb first. But when John gets to the tomb, all he does is look in, he doesn't go in. Peter gets there, the bold one. He goes in, and what he finds is not a chaotic, empty tomb where things were thrown around, but he found something organized and orderly. He found something that caused something like faith to begin stirring up in him. And then the process began of, of sightings of Jesus continuing. Thirteen different sightings where hundreds of people saw him over the course of the next 40 days. At least 13 that are recorded in Scripture. And in all of it, we've got a picture of, of the process that, that happens so many times for, for us with faith. This 
this thing that we're talking about called the resurrection um, is something that the Apostle Paul addresses in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where he says, But if the Spirit of him, that of God, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Now, what I what I've felt pretty strongly about this morning is that we need to talk about doubt today, about doubters today, about people who doubt today. And there's a lot of us out there. I think, I think a lot of us need to, to not, not try to avoid the reality of where our hearts and our minds really are. I mean, truly, there can't be faith without doubt in the same way that there can't be courage without fear. In order to have courage, there's got to be some fear to be able to exercise courage in the midst of. In order to have faith, there's got to be something there to doubt that you struggle with. And I think today, what we can look at as a source of encouragement, in addition to the physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, is the way these disciples who'd followed Jesus for three years were a group of doubters all the way through. And how, in, in, a, in a way, that's good news for us. That's good news for us. I mean, I kind of think it's good news sometimes when, when I see people who are like worse than me. And in some ways, as I look at the disciples, it looks like they're worse than me sometimes in terms of, of what, they, what they believed and what they didn't believe. I mean, when you get to the end of Matthew 28, you've got the account of um, Matthew, one of Jesus' followers, as Jesus is giving the Great Commission. Matthew 28, beginning verse 16, says the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated, and when they saw him, get this, the 11, when the 11 saw him, they worshiped him, but some were still doubtful. But some were still doubtful. I mean, this is after multiple physical appearances of Jesus. This is after, after these encounters, and, and still there was doubt in place with, with, these, with these disciples. I mean, the, um, the idea today that I'd, I'd like to look at again is, is how we handle doubt, what we do with doubt, how we get past doubt, and look at some examples of some very famous doubters that we have in the Bible. Uh, one of the first ones is in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 24. Some of you have seen that story before. This is when Jesus, still alive in his earthly, in his earthly ministry, and there's a guy whose son is demon-possessed. He brought his son to the disciples to get them to cast the demon out, and, and they couldn't do it. And the guy comes to Jesus, and this is what he says, beginning of verse 17. One of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they couldn't do it. And he answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him, and then Jesus asked the father, How long has it been happening? The father said, Through childhood, often throws him into the water, into the fire to destroy him. But if, Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, If, if you can. I mean, it's hard to understand exactly what Jesus' attitude was when he was saying this. You know, whether he was kind of, you know, taken aback by it or what, what he was looking like when he said it. But, but I'm thinking, you know, he's asking the Father, what are you talking about? If I, I can. He goes, all things are possible to him who believes. And this is the important verse, verse 24. Immediately the boy's father cries out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. That's where most of us are. That's where most, most of us are a lot of the times. I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe that you're Jesus. I do believe the promises that you've made are true, but, but help my un, unbelief in, in this process. I mean, what the Father needed and what most of us need is an experience of God. That's what the father had to have, the experience of Jesus actually stepping in. The facts are the facts in terms of Jesus' death 
in his resurrection. The facts are the facts in terms of what the Bible lays out, in terms of what's required for salvation. But the application of the facts comes by experience most of the time. The application of the facts comes as an individual thing that enters into people's lives in different ways. And it's what what happened here repeatedly in Scripture. Second great example of it is with Thomas in in John chapter 20. You've got Thomas, one of, the, one of the 12, one of the 11 after Judas is kicked out. You've got Thomas who does what? Well, poor Thomas is not around when Jesus comes and makes his first appearance to the disciples because what happens after, after Mary and Mary came back saying the tomb is empty? What happened after Peter and John ran and saw that the tomb was empty? They all came back, they're gathered in one room together, all the disciples, except for Judas and Thomas, and Jesus walks through the door, not through the doorway, through the door. Jesus walks in, and they see him, and, you know, great deal. They're all saying, wow, you did rise from the dead. Thomas catches up with them later. We don't know where he was in the meantime, but he catches up with them later, and in John chapter 20, this is what, what happens. He's Not with them, it says in verse 24, when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, because of that statement, Thomas has been labeled for all time doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. You know, it's a weird deal when you think about it. I mean, you got Peter who denies Jesus three times and cusses out, you know, a slave girl as he's proving he's not a Christian, and we don't call him profane Peter. I mean, what we do, though, is pick out Thomas and call him Doubting Thomas because he said, I'm not going to believe unless I've had the experience he encounter myself with, with Jesus. And, and the reality is, what would have happened if Thomas had been there initially with the 11 when Jesus first came in, and it was another one of the disciples who hadn't been there. I, I think any one of the disciples who were in Thomas's position could just as easily have been the doubting Peter, John, Matthew, because they hadn't had the experience too. So what happens? What happens after this? <sighs> after eight days, after he said, I will not believe, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, and Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see me and, and yet believed. <laughs> the, the deal is this. What we see in these stories with both the father whose son was possessed by the demon, who said, I do believe, help my unbelief. With Thomas, who said, I'm not going to believe unless I've, unless I've experienced Jesus myself, and I see the resurrected Jesus myself. What we have here is a picture of guys who were given second chances, a picture of, of people who prove that doubt doesn't stop an encounter with Jesus, that doubt is not going to keep us from this, this encounter with Jesus. It won't keep Jesus away. Um, I think of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. Uh, he was a, a writer. He was a, a professor at Oxford University. Uh, he became a theologian later. But, but here's his story. He was baptized as, as a child, raised in a home, Anglican home, that, that believed in Jesus. But at 15, he became an atheist. He declared he did not believe in God. And he went along that path until he was 29. At 29, he met a guy named Tolkien. Tolkien's the guy who wrote all the Lord of the Rings books. And Tolkien was a, a follower of Jesus. And Tolkien began the, con the, the process of discussion with, with Lewis about, about God, about the things of God. And, you know, you can only imagine the, the intellectual arguments that these two great minds got into. But after a couple of years, the arguments of Tolkien still had not convinced Lewis. But something else did. And Lewis writes about it in an autobiography called Surprised by Joy. At 31, he received Jesus. And it wasn't because he was argued into it. It was because he was, and you can see it if you want to read the book, he was surprised by joy. He was surprised by the experience 
of, of Jesus coming into his life. Not, not a visible Jesus who appeared at the foot of his bed, but the personal experience of an encounter with Jesus. And, and this is, I think, where, where we need to, to take encouragement. It's the idea that, that doubts aren't going to keep Jesus away, but we have got to be ready to take steps towards Jesus in order to see the doubts go away. I mean, what happened with Thomas? He had to take the step towards Jesus and reaching out and putting his hand in Jesus' side and his finger in the holes in his hands. What with Lewis? It's a, it's a matter of reaching out and actually engaging with Tolkien. And the arguments didn't convince him, but it set the stage for the encounter that was to come. I mean, the last thing in the world that you should want to do is to argue somebody into the kingdom to argue somebody into faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you, if I, can argue you into believing in Jesus, then somebody smarter is going to come along who can argue you out of believing in Jesus. It's got to be this matter of, yes, understanding what the storyline is, understanding the facts and the revelation of God, understanding the historical events that happened, the death and the resurrection, but, but then having that, that experience that encounter with Jesus, that encounter that's in the head and in the heart, that, that, changes, that changes everything in terms of, of how, we, how we live out the, the rest of life. It's why here we have actually tried to set this church up as a place that, that acknowledges that the journey of faith is just that, a journey. It's, it's oftentimes a matter of of not getting it initially in terms of who Jesus is. And, and we don't require you to have faith in Jesus before you belong and are feeling comfortable here. We don't require you to get your act cleaned up before you, you are part of the process here. We want you to be part of the process and to come in, to take the steps towards Jesus. And and we want to participate in that journey with you, to help you along in that journey, to understand what it's all about. It, it, you can be a, a volunteer here. You can be a greeter here. You can certainly help set up chairs and break down chairs 5.30 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, every Sunday, and make some connections and relationship here. It's the idea that connecting in, having the, the engagement in, in co- conversations, and setting the, setting the table in advance in preparation for the meal that, that metaphorically Jesus brings with the experience of him in your life is, is something that, that we want to, to play, play a part with, to play a part in that, in, that, in that journey. And it's, again, something that for some people, it could happen in a moment of time. It might happen today. It might happen right this second where Jesus enters your heart and, and wakes you up from the dead. But it might be six months from now. It might be a year from now. And again, we want to, be a part of helping you through that process. And it's why we'd love you to just connect in. Come back next Sunday. Come back the Sunday after that. Connect in with the Alpha. Connect in with small groups. Connect in with serving. Connect in in, in the conversations that need to happen in order for you to move forward in the process that, that I think God wants to bring everyone through to know him, find freedom, discover their purpose, and then make, make a difference in, in their lives. It's the idea that ultimately, ultimately, the experience, though, the connection, the faith, culminates in a commitment, a commitment of faith that, again, comes by recognition of what the facts are, the truth, but comes as that, that again, experience of Jesus comes in, which looks a little bit different for everybody. Um, it reminds me of the story, and you've, many of you have heard it so many times before, of uh, Charles Blondin, famous tightrope walker, acrobat. I mean, Blondin was actually trained in an acrobatic school that his parents sent him to when he was a teenager. He then um, immigrated to the U.S. and became very famous for his tightrope walks across Niagara Falls. Now, you know, after a while, I guess old hat, right? You walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope a few times, and everybody goes, okay, seen that, done that don't need to see it again. So he had to keep up in his game with it. And what he did was he'd go across it in stilts. He went across it pushing a wheelbarrow. He went across it pushing a wheelbarrow with rocks in it. And then ultimately, he was trying to go even further. And he asked the crowd one day that was watching him, said, do you think I could go across pushing a wheelbarrow with a person sitting in the wheelbarrow? 
and the crowd is like, Palm Sunday, Hosanna, you're the Messiah. Yeah, you can do anything, Charles. Go for it. Yes, you can do it. Do I have any volunteers? No hands went up. Now, I've heard two versions of this story. One is no hands went up. The other is one hand went up in the back, old lady in the back. She said, I, I trust you can do it. It was his mother. She hopped in the wheelbarrow. He pushed it across. What's the point of the story? The point of the story is a declaration of faith only counts for so much. Ultimately, you're going to have to get in the wheelbarrow. Ultimately, you've got to rest in who Jesus is what Jesus did, and what that means in terms of what you're to do. Some of you are here today, and again, you've got doubts, you came in with doubts, and you think you have reasons for your doubts. You think that you're living in an unjust world, and if there was a God, why in the world would the world look like it does now? With pandemics, with politics, with wars in Ukraine, I mean, why, why, why? You've got concerns about the past. Some of you right here today have a concern on why your child died before he turned 12, on why you are in a wheelchair on why people that you loved have died long before they should die, on why you lost a job, on why the hurts came in. And the truth is, hurts do come in, but the, the doubts that accompany the hurts are what Jesus wants us to get past. It may be part of the journey, but ultimately what happens is in the, in the big picture as you move forward in the journey of faith, you, you do receive this assurance from Jesus that we're in the world of a sovereign God and that every untruth will be revealed ultimately for what it is, that every hurt will be ultimately revealed for the longer good that came to be brought. I know that makes no sense right now, but I also know that with the faith that involves getting in the wheelbarrow, that we believe that ultimately we will understand it, and it plays out. It, it's, again, again, the, the idea that Jesus is calling you today, some of you, to bring that journey to its culmination of getting in the wheelbarrow. For others of you, it's to make that commitment to go with the journey. Join with us here for a year and see what that journey looks like for one year in terms of the connections that you can make, in terms of alpha, in terms of just showing up each week to see what God might bring into the picture for you. And, and watch and see if if the doubts don't begin to fade as the revelation, as the experience of Jesus begins to become bigger and more clear in your life. And I've got every confidence that it will, that he will reveal himself to you, that he will allow you the privilege of experiencing his presence and the reality that he is not a dead savior, but a risen, a risen Lord and Savior that intends to bring about good things for his children. We're going to pray in just a moment. And um, I want to pray for you to be, to be freed from bondage, to be able to, to take the steps in doubt that God has for you to take towards Jesus and for you to experience that, that presence of God in your life in a new way today and this week. We're going to have folks on the prayer ministry team up here in just a moment after that to pray individually for any particular need that you might have, okay? Father, we thank you today that you are the sovereign God over all creation. Father, you created me, you created every person in here, and you did that with the desire that we come to know you through faith in Jesus. We thank you that you desire freedom for us that Jesus came to bring. We thank you that you created us with, with a purpose in mind and that you desire for us to fulfill that purpose and make a difference with the lives that you've given us. I just speak now in the name of Jesus Christ, every mind, every person that's online, outside, inside right now that, that has that struggle with doubt. And I ask that you would show them 
the next step there to take in reaching out to you, whatever that's supposed to look like. I ask for those that have been, have been waffling, thinking they believe, but not sure they believe enough to understand that you know their situation in their heart and their mind and give them that ability to take the step of commitment and just get in the wheelbarrow. I ask for your blessing, Father, as you move in power, causing hurts, pains of the past to fade as the reality of the present and the future that you've got before us become, become clearer and clearer in, in our mind's view. I just pray blessing today that comes from you, Holy Spirit, as you do what only you can do in terms of bringing the gift of repentance, that is, that gift of changing our minds about what's real and what's not, as you move us to be people who can believe. All of this, we ask in the power of Jesus Christ's name, the risen Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, if you're on the prayer ministry team, if you wouldn't mind coming up here to the front, um, we've got folks that would love to be able to pray with you today. Do we have prayer ministers today? I hope so. I'll be up here anyway. Here we go. They got, got, got them coming inside. They didn't have a seat. Um, we have another service tonight at 6 o'clock. Love to have you come back and join us if you want to. Uh, and beyond that, check at the connection table. And folks out there can tell you what the next steps are you can take now. And again, through the summer and fall, we'll have many other opportunities that do open up. God bless you. Have a happy Easter.